Thank you. First of all, the embassy, the Uzbek government delegation, AUCC for making this evening possible. I think we can all agree, just by looking at the numbers of people who are here, this is an extraordinary time in Uzbekistan. As Carolyn said, the AUCC has grown from three members to 39, and that's because of her great work, Elena Sohn's great work, and also, most importantly, all the exciting changes that are taking place in Uzbekistan. You heard some about that during the opening remarks, and now we're going to begin two panel discussions in which we're going to drill a little bit deeper and hear more specifically about what's going on in Uzbekistan. Um, our first panelists today are <coughs> Minister of Justice, Dov who has been behind so many of the important changes in the area of anti-corruption that, um, that Carolyn was talking about, and the head of the Capital Markets uh, Development Agency, Mr. Nazero. And I'm going to start out, we're going to proceed in the following way. I'm going to ask each of our panelists a couple of questions, but no more than that. Because we have so much great expertise in the room. We have several former US ambassadors. We've got Alpha Uri Mamova. So many people who know this country so well. And I want to make sure that everyone in the audience also has the opportunity to ask questions. So I'm going to start by um, with you, Minister Dovdetu. Um, Carolyn finished her opening remarks by talking about anti-corruption, the rule of law, and the roadmap that the country has developed to build the rule of law in Uzbekistan and to combat corruption. She said she wouldn't go on for too long because you'll hear a lot more about this from Minister Dabaneta. So now we're going to hear more about this from Minister Dabaneta. Tell us more specifically, what is the country's roadmap for building the rule of law and combating corruption? I think that you know, Carolyn, if she didn't raise this question, you would have asked her anyway. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> she gave me a good lead-in, so I'm taking advantage of the lead-in, so tell us. Well, uh, let's start with corruption, yeah? There's a, the problem is really big. It is causing tremendous problems in society's uh, development. And we see the problem, and we discuss it for the first time even on the level of the legal state, and actually uh, it was the first initiative of the president to initiate the set up under the Senate and uh, of course this uh, the new program on combating corruption is already uh, being realized, implemented and if the problem, if the issue of corruption was overseen by the General Service Office now this issue has been uh, upgraded to the level of Senate and the Chairman of the Senate is dealing directly with the issues of corruption. And if you look at this latest legal act of the President, there is a real political, strong political will to fight corruption. And there are many, many measures including making uh, the, the way the government agencies work transparent so that they are accountable. And then uh, we're getting rid of many, many secret documents so that we're going to open that uh, to the society. And second, uh, the, the economy, because there's a big, big presence by the state in the economy. And there's a instruction by the president to make minimum uh, presence uh, of state enterprises. Uh, because if you look at how they are being uh, managed, it's like really Soviet style, old style way of managing these companies. And we have to change this. And there is a, uh, Mr. Nazir will talk about this. And there is a big way ahead about this issue because the 
where there is a state, there is always a problem with managing the assets. There is a corruption. So we concede that there is a problem with this and we want to move forward and privatize many, many spheres. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the latest act of privatization, you can see that eight banks, eight national banks are being privatized. So this is a really big step ahead. And uh, another issue regarding the corruption is to make really modern state regulation. There is a concept of administrative reforms which have been, has been passed two years ago and it is being implemented at this moment. Uh, we reviewed the functions of 73 government agencies already. Seven of them were liquidated, nine more ministers were created, modern ministers including Minister for Transport, uh, Ministry for Energy, uh, Special uh, Anti-Monopoly Committee, which is very independent, which is, as you know, is really big importance for uh, competition. And Minister of Justice is central in this reform because if you look at the process, any reform is done through legal acts. I will give you one figure. For the last two years, we passed 4,000 legal acts. And not including the statutes of the parliament. They are all resolutions of the cabinet of ministers and presidential acts, 4,000 of them. And only these six months, the Minister of Justice has done legal expertise of 1,500 legal acts. This is 8% of the whole uh, volume of the legal acts that we have in Uzbekistan at this moment. So you can see the volume, you can see the, uh, the, the work that we are doing and 70% uh, of what we are doing is directly involved with the issues of fighting corruption, bureaucracy and cutting the red tape. Great, so if I could just summarize, it sounds to me like the game plan for fighting corruption is going back to first principles in fighting corruption, reducing the role of government in the economy and transparency, and that is really what it comes down to. You can argue about the details, change this, change that, but that's really the fundamentals, and it seems to me like you are focusing on those fundamentals. One thing we hear a lot about, you mentioned, it was mentioned several times in the introductions, is privatization and the new law on public-private partnerships. This is something that's discussed. I don't know how well it's actually understood in detail. Can you say a few words about that, why that is so important to attract these foreign investment and combat corruption or reform the economy? Uh, when we talk about public-private partnership, this is a, the, we have new law. It has been passed, it's been signed by the president, and it is already working on a special agency for PPP. And when we talk about the investors, we don't only, as a, as a lawyer, uh, I expect to import values, new values. These are you know, anti-corruption compliance, uh, new standard, standards of working, organizing the work, new uh, approaches in labor legislation, because when we talk about the foreign investment, sometimes we, I mean, we forget about the labor legislation. If you uh, analyze the labor legislation of Pakistan, it is like really social type of legislation where there is a big, uh, uh, I mean, the employer has many, many obligations before the employees. So you, you have, we have to change this, fix this, and make it more flexible. More flexible when you're firing, hiring, and the siblings, and so on. Foreign companies can hire and fire whoever they want. Within reason. Of course, there, there must be rules. <laughs> they can't like involve with rules. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. You should have. But at this moment, the labor legislation we have to make it uh, more flexible. So this is, uh, as a lawyer, I expect to uh, the foreign companies to bring to the not only technology. And of course, we have very big challenge regarding the human resources because the, the area is new, the people are demanding their rights, social media is on the rise, and the civil service. 
there is a big problem with civil servants, so that we need to train all the civil servants, and we are investing in this sphere too much money, and attracting uh, grants and assistance, including uh, U.S. government, for instance, Minister of Justice, who has a really big project with USA, and a big part of this project is to train our uh, legal workers. Great. And one, I'm going to ask you one more question before I go to um, uh, Mr. Nazir. A few months ago, I attended your legal forum in Tashkent. It was the first event ever of this kind, the Tashkent um, legal forum. It was tremendous attendance. I think over a thousand people were there. And I was struck by how many different foreign models you were looking at. I remember seeing you on a panel, and I think you were up there with the Minister of Justice of Singapore, and maybe there was somebody from the UK and Australia on that same panel. I was on a panel at the end of the program with somebody from it was Russia, Belarus, and maybe Ukraine also on that panel. We seem to be looking to a lot of different foreign models with the goal of taking the best of each one of them and combining them, because of course there's there are certain fundamental principles, but there's no one size fits all in anti corruption or rule of law. It's got to be adapted to local conditions. Can you talk about how you're trying to different foreign models for looking to and legal reform before you're talking about? Um, this is a very general question because we have spheres, we have uh, different directions of reforms, and it depends on the best practice. We look at the best practice of all the uh, reforms that we uh, do all the time. So, if we talk about the uh, bringing the investment and making a better investment climate, we are also at this moment uh, studying the to introduce the English law on the territory of Uzbekistan. Of course, this is uh, really revolutionary, but we looked at the experience of our neighbors. You know, Dubai did the same, Hong Kong has the English system, Kazakhstan is doing those things in uh, 2015. So there is a big opportunity to use the same uh, model on limited territory of Uzbekistan because Maybe Mr. Nazir will talk more about the financial center concept and perspectives. But we look at the best practices no matter what country uh, countries crisis it is. And uh, US justice system is also of great importance for us. Of course, in terms of procedure, in terms of uh, the, the way they work, it's totally different. But if you look at the structure, if you look at the independence, how the use judiciary is independent and how it's uh, being financed and, and hiring issues and discipline measures. So these are all of great importance for us. Great, thank you. Now I want to turn to Mr. Nasir, the head of the Capital Markets Development Agency, and I want to talk about what you're doing to attract capital to Uzbekistan. First, I expect I some preliminary questions. Just, you've got a fascinating story, as I understand it. You emigrated from Uzbekistan with your family. You had a very prosperous career as a banker in the West. You worked at Goldman Sachs, I believe, EBRD. And then one day, if I'm not mistaken, you met President Rizoya, who didn't know when he came to New York in September of 17. And he and Senator uh, Sapphire recruited you to come back, they said we want things back to the diaspora to come back and help us build the country. And you left a great career in the West to go back and be part of the government. You were first Deputy Minister of Innovation, and then Deputy Minister of Education, and now you're head of the Capital Markets Development Agency. So in your time, you've done a remarkable amount in the government. Tell us, why, why did you give up your great career in the West to go back and be part of the government of Uzbekistan? If I have to give you a very brief and short answer, I think it would be that I all, ever since my family left Uzbekistan, I always dreamed of going back to Uzbekistan. And um, when the opportunity like this came about, and we saw the uh, amount of energy that was coming from Tashkent, the reform agenda that the president was putting forward, I think it would be a shame not to take the opportunity uh, take the chance. After spending a year and almost three months with uh, the government, I can tell you it's been a really fantastic journey in being involved in a reform program that 
that's taken place. Let me tell you honestly, there has never been any red tape from anybody in the government of Uzbekistan uh, trying to either uh, resist the ideas that they put forward or um, sharing the expertise that you know, I have gained and some of my you know, other colleagues who came back from, from abroad. Uh, obviously, it's not an easy journey. There are you know, ups and downs, there are competition of ideas, um, which is good. Uh, and obviously, the best ideas win. But I'll tell you, it's been, a, as I said, uh, probably the best time of my career to take it all together to be part of this uh, historic. Really historic time in Uzbekistan because uh, you have a chance to contribute to the shape of the new nation that's uh, been built in Uzbekistan as they want. And how are you received? You're an outsider, you're part of a younger, new generation with a different kind of training, a different set of experiences, who's lived over here, lived overseas for a number of years, and now you're coming back into a system which, you know, a lot of people have been there a lot of time. How is that integrating into that system? Tough from the pause, but this is going to be an interesting answer. <laughs> It's all about uh, building a life with friends. Uh, on one hand, you want to be, uh, you know, you want to be accepted. Uh, although, you know, I was raised in Uzbekistan, but I spent most of my life abroad. Uh, my kind of, my adult life was abroad, and uh, it was not an easy process. Yeah, I'll tell you, because obviously uh, the perspective from which you look at things. Are, Ways you try to solve problems is different, but I think it has nothing to do with you know, the, uh, the government of Uzbekistan. I mean, it's just I think it would be the same story if I would join, let's say, a government of you know, the United States. Uh, coming from private sector to a government in itself is a big challenge. Let alone you know joining a different uh, different country. So I think the first probably month I had a headache every day just because it was totally different. Working style, working process, but now I feel very comfortable. Now you're the head of a new agency. The Capital Markets Development Agency is relatively new, set up in January, if I'm not mistaken. And before that, you were, you know, had two other part of two other ministries. Tell us what exactly is the Capital Markets Development Agency, and what specifically are you doing for attractive investment? So the Capital Market Development Agency was set up uh, by a presidential decree at the end of uh, January of this year with. Uh, Two main mandates. Mandate number one is the development of capital markets and uh, bringing uh, institutional portfolio investors to steer capital into uh, corporations. <coughs> the second mandate of our agency is to regulate and enforce uh, the rules of the game on two laws. One is the law on securities markets, and the second is law on uh, joint stock companies. So we have a clear objective to balance the Uzbek economy in terms of its financing. Historically, the country has been financed primarily by bank loans, local loans, national loans, and unfortunately, debt has its constraints. We know that the debt is dangerous. You need to be able to properly structure your, your projects, and uh, but when it comes to a growing economy, we all recognize that new businesses, new initiatives, they fund by more risky capital, by you know, equity capital, by bonds. So if we look at the banking sector in Uzbekistan, the total size is approximately $27 billion in dollar pooling of its assets. Uh, the capital market uh, free flow adjusted uh, valuation is uh, less than 300 million. So our goal is to try to find a way for companies uh, to raise capital and for Uzbek economy to, to attract investment for capital markets, which is bond, bond issues, you know, the equities, and even for Uzbek government to start using local investor base to issue treasuries, you with the Uzbek treasury notes on local markets. As uh, Sarah Sapphire mentioned, we had a successful euro bond issue in January of this year, selling up to $1 billion worth of euro bonds to international investors. But nothing now prohibits us from doing a similar exercise on local markets and issuing local currency paper. You know, this is very important that we focus.
denormalization, that we focus on issuing local currency policy, and that we focus on our own currency in order to avoid uh, dollarization risks and uh, risks of potential default in the future. These are really dramatic, revolutionary changes uh, um, for the region, for Uzbekistan. One final question. Have you been working with your counterparts? You're here in the U.S. Have you been working with your counterparts as a SEC, Treasury Department, in the area of best practices, technical assistance? Uh, yes. We both are first engaged with, uh, with the Korean regulator. Mm -hmm. Most of these we have a relationship uh, with the Korean government. Uh, by the way, our stock exchange in Tashkent and uh, the chairman is here this evening. So he's 25% uh, owned by the Korean stock exchange, so we have a very good uh, technological platform. Uh, with regards to U.S. partners, yes, we're in town this week uh, with my colleagues and the a delegation to build relationships with key U.S. counterparts, uh, including the U.S. Treasury, with whom uh, the government of Uzbekistan signed a memorandum uh, yesterday to provide technical assistance on helping the, uh, our Minister of Finance to issue local paper, local bonds on local capital markets. Uh, we're also building cooperation in relation to the Security Exchange Commission. Uh, we're building a cooperation hopefully with FINRA, uh, which is the uh, self-regulatory agency in the United States. Having started my career on Wall Street, I am probably biased towards the United States being as a role model for the global capital markets. You know, looking at the U.S. valuation of more than 30 trillion plus uh, of equities and more in bond markets, we, I think, in the world today, and my, I personally recognize the United States model as probably the best model in the world at the moment in terms of uh, allowing for liquidity and bringing capital with, uh, with uh, entrepreneurs and investors. Yeah. So I will be tempted to try to imitate this model and bring as much best practices to Uzbekistan. Well, I think that the Uzbek-U.S. trade relationship is definitely much better. It's richer. The economic relationship is richer for somebody like you with experience, with deep experience in both countries in the position that you have. Um, before we move on, I want to throw it open to questions. I've been asking all the questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Eric, did you have a question? <laughs> Eric Schultz, uh, <laughs> former U.S. ambassador, I think, has a question. I ask everyone when you sit, when you have a question, please stand up, introduce yourself, and um, finish your question with a question mark, not a statement. Um, I thought this was going to be a Jeopardy thing, and I was going to have to like make it into a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Um, okay, so my name is Eric Schultz. I'm a retired foreign service officer. My last job was as ambassador in Zambia. Uh, before that, I was ECM in Ukraine. Um, so I guess my question for you would be, what's your timeline? Uh, I mean, you know, you don't create a capital market over, overnight, you've been at it for a while. Um, I, I mean, I was just actually a little aware when you said 300 million, that's how, how big the capital market is now. That's pretty extraordinary, so you've got a lot of work to have uh, How fast are you trying to move? What's, what's the goal? Did everyone hear the question? What's the timeline for this? How fast are they trying to move? What's the goal? Uh, we have identified a tangible and uh, deliverable goal of uh, increasing free float market cap of our equities and bonds to about 10% of GDP within five years. And this is something we uh, think is uh, aggressive, but it's our target, which will imply uh, probably tenfold increase over the next five years of uh, valuation of the companies. And uh, it will come through, obviously, privatizations. Uh, we have a list of state-owned companies, banks, to be listed or widely listed on our exchange. Uh, we'll be looking forward to increase the number of products that are offered on uh, capital markets, including uh, issuance of municipal bonds. My team uh, and with the Ministry of Finance are working on changing of tax codes and other obstacles to allow local municipalities to raise their own debt and be able to um, you know, account for their own money. Uh, and obviously, what we're also doing at the moment is removing all possible restrictions that exist at the moment through regulatory uh, constraints and allow wider range of companies to participate in public markets. For example, law at the moment prohibits uh, non-joint stock companies from issuing bonds, and there are tight restrictions on how much you can issue in terms of uh, relationship to your capital 
and uh, security. So if you, if a company, let's say LC, wants to issue a bond, uh, you can't do it at the moment. And the joint stock company can issue bonds up to its equity size. Uh, it has to be secured. So we put a proposition to the uh, exchange the laws, which should hopefully take place sometime by the end of the summer. Uh, we're working 24-7. Unfortunately, my team uh, is very tired. I, I'm getting tired sometimes. So, but that's the reality today. Uh, and with the assistance that we're getting and support we're getting from the international community, including banks like EBRD, uh, the Asian Development Bank, with whom we are now working on technical assistance with regards to comprehensive strategy review and uh, help with changing of our regulatory framework. Uh, I hope it will be uh, tangible goals. Great. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Now, go for Thank you so much, Nan Warren Lola from Boys in America. Maybe we don't even have to use this because it's not really working for it. Hello. Well, I can always speak louder. Speak and yes, we can repeat it. That's fine. Yes. Use my broadcast voice, right? So, <laughs> there you go. Um, very good to have both of you here and the entire obviously. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Nazirov. You just talked about your international partners and who you're working globally to develop capital markets for Uzbekistan. Keeping in mind that the banking culture is quite primitive in Uzbekistan and the private sector is quite okay, who are some of the domestic players that you're working with, that you want to rely on, and what's the um, you know, financial climate like in Uzbekistan now? So the question is, who are the domestic players that are relying on what is the financial climate like yeah, in this okay. country, given that it's still developing? Definitely. And I'll have a question for you, too, but I'll wait. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. When you ask about local players, do you mean local investors? Do you mean yeah, local, local investors, local businesses who want to bring in capital. We uh, have done sort of quick back of the envelope analysis of how much potential capital available for investors in Uzbekistan. And I think that figure ranges between 10 to 30 billion dollars that is in Uzbekistan, uh, outside of the banking system, which means at home, uh, in dollars, possibly. Uh, and that money needs to find a way to work. Yeah? The best way to do it is by doing kind of collective investment streams, uh, mutual fund type of products in Uzbekistan. Unfortunately, we have a very small professional industry, and I'm happy to see some of the players here uh, who have uh, operations in Uzbekistan. Um, we will be spending a lot of time and effort in trying to bring out or increase our own institutional capacity in terms of broker dealers, and this is why we're meeting with FINRA tomorrow and we'll talk about uh, assistance in helping to setting up our own self-regulatory uh, players in Uzbekistan. In terms of investor base, otherwise, uh, obviously there are insurance companies, banks, uh, which currently is not allowed to invest in equities. Uh, we're working with the central bank to see if they can uh, make changes in this world. But other than that, it's a really collective and uh, systematic process of kind of bringing everybody to the table and uh, find a way how to implement that in a structured way. And you also had a question for Minister Dr. You know, as much as the Uzbek government wants to welcome international organizations, they've been telling us and them that the, the door is opening wider and wider. Several of them who are eager and deeply interested to work with Uzbekistan feel stuck legally. I'm talking about organizations like Human Rights Watch, who already have access to the country, but they want to get registered. And then there are organizations like the Freedom House and IRECs and Internews, whose <coughs> operations were liquidated by the courts of Uzbekistan a while ago. So they have a certain baggage. And they tell us that they want to open a new page, but they can't because they don't see a way to get registered or accredited. <coughs> What kind of options do they have? They want to have a permanent presence in the country. And is the government thinking of creating new conditions or maybe opening a really new page to give them more access? So just to make sure everyone heard, the question was about the registration of NGOs, some of which have been shut down previously. What is the government doing to create an environment where they can re-register and come back to the country? 
in your sector in Uzbekistan is blooming at the moment. We already have 9,000 registered NGOs working on all spheres and many, many more coming because of the new era. And about the cases that you raise, we have to look at them individually. Because if you talk about hate criminal rights watch, there is a decision by the Supreme Court of Uzbekistan about liquidating this organization back in 2005. So there is a legal issue because the, the decision is in force. Uh, but we do have really good relations with HRV and uh, Mr. Sunilov is coming all the time to Uzbekistan and, and doing his uh, you know, everyday functions and with no barriers. Uh, so if the, the same problems uh, we have with some others as well, but uh, we are open to partnership because you know, they are working without him, even registering. Uh, it's not it's not a big issue at this moment. Uh, and there is no barrier not to work without the legislation. But we're in the process of dealing with the issue and there is no problem with opening a new page uh, in partnership with these NGOs. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in Human Rights Watch, the, the other organizations, our partners can say that uh, they are not having any problems with Uzbek government. So that's why uh, my recommendation we, we need to look at these matters individually. But overall, the situation has been liberalized. The, there is a prescribed uh, in the legislation the procedure, which was simplified really significantly in terms of time, in terms of uh, the documents that they supply, in terms of the uh, the fees that they pay and all the procedures they have been simplified, including on religious organizations as well. Great. I think we have time for one more question and then we've got to move on because we're a little behind schedule. Uh, Michelle Small, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there so patiently, leaving, I can't can say anything. Can I say, no. it doesn't end with the question mark. It's a statement, I'm sorry to say. Um, <laughs> EBRD has been so Please introduce yourself. Oh, you, you, sorry. I'm, you're breaking one rule. You can only break one rule. Oh, so you, okay. <laughs> Michelle Small, the representative of EBRD in North America. And my comment is, is that we have been strongly supporting the government in Uzbekistan for the last two and a half years. We are completely involved with Atabek and his team with the Capital Markets Program. We, along with ADB, are supporting the technical assistance. We are supporting the banks and shoring up the banks. We are trying to make this country, and we will do it, a more investable place for you guys to come. So, I always do this at the end of everything, and talk to people like that know this. Um, you come and see me, you come and see my team. If you're interested in investing in Uzbekistan, we make a good partner. We are a partner for Uzbekistan. This year we hope to do about 1 billion euros investment. And that's high. Thank you very much. No question mark. <laughs> and that's a great note on which to end this panel. Please join me in thanking Minister Davidetov, uh, head of the Capital and Markets Development Agency, Mr. Nazirov, and uh, for a great panel. I think it was very informative. Thank you very much. forward to cooperating with both of you. With that, I think we're going to roll straight into the following yeah. panel, so I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Deputy Minister Kudrapov and J.P. Mackin to come up. Almost. <laughs> so please continue eating. Nobody will be insulted if you eat during this panel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay, we're going to continue the discussion now with two more experts on the investment environment in um, in Uzbekistan. To my left is Jake Manakin, who is a partner in Macro Advisory Group, which is one of the finest agencies, finest consulting companies, working with portfolio and strategic investments, helping them to invest in various emerging markets, including, but not limited to, Uzbekistan. To my right is Deputy Minister of uh, Trade. 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 Trade.
Washington knows the investment environment for both sides like nobody. And so I think these are this is a great time to wrap up our discussion. And if you want to go on, I'm going to break the protocol a little bit. I'm going to start with Jake and not get the microphone to come to you. My question to you, Jake, is you represent a lot of American investors, portfolio investors, strategic investors. You've been listening all night and working with them. What can Uzbekistan do to make itself more attractive to portfolio investors? Well, I think um, I think we're actually seeing it happening as we speak. I mean, you know, over the last two years, the focus has obviously been on more on the strategic investment. But uh, the previous panel or the speeches earlier touched on a lot of the key things that we need to see. Uh, I'll take a step back before I get into more detail. Uh, you know, one of the great opportunities that Uzbekistan's been presented with is that they're the last to sort of open up within the Eurasia region. And with that comes the benefit of learning from others, others' experiences, others' mistakes, others' successes. And at this point, from a portfolio investment perspective, they're doing a lot of the right things. Uzbekistan has obviously made a big push into attracting investment, but now they're focusing very much on the structural changes. And that ranges from a focus on increased corporate governance, uh, cracking down on corruption, improved and increased transparency. And the fact that we now have the Capital Markets Development Agency, that's the next critical step. And that is creating the infrastructure, creating the institutions and infrastructure that will support and sustain capital markets and financial markets as the market opens. And what you talked about, you know, Uzbekistan has the advantage in some ways being the, you know, most recent country to reform. It can draw on the experience of all these other countries. And as I said, as the Minister of Delta, that's something I saw at the Tashkent Law Forum. They had examples from every country. You know, they were not modeling themselves too much after one experience, but trying to pick and choose the best from everything to put together something unique. What, in terms of attracting investment for some of the lessons learned from neighboring former Soviet countries and other emerging markets? Yeah, no, I think it's a very good question and a very important opportunity that Uzbekistan has learning from others. You know, case in point, Central Europe, Poland, Czech, Hungary, uh, they created and built the legal and structural institutions to support and sustain these markets, both in terms of not just strategic investment, but developing real, liquid, attractive capital financial markets with corporate governance and transparency. They, they then moved more towards the privatization on the back end. Russia, on the other hand, and obviously the circumstances were different, there was this push to privatize before there were any legal structures. And on the back of that, we had the creation of loans for shares, the creation of the oligarchs. And it was only later that Russia took a step back, and actually they deserve a lot of credit. They created the FCSM, which is their, uh, their, their securities regulated market regulatory body, which is actually a very well-managed and a very good structure. But that was after the fact. So, you know, again, Uzbekistan has that opportunity, but most importantly, we're seeing that they're capitalizing on it. They are clearly learning from those lessons. And the fact that we have the Capital Markets Development Agency run by a former Goldman banker with global experience is a very positive good sign. You're getting people with the know-how, with the experience, and the benefit of case studies of successes and not so successes to benefit from. So it sounds like you're saying the main lesson, or I got it from what you just said, the main lesson learned is you've got to have a good legal regulatory framework in place before you liberalize and open up the economy. Absolutely. And, you know, again, using Russia as an example, they do deserve a lot of credit. They've improved the structures for their markets significantly, but it was after a very long and painful process uh, with the uh, you know, a lot of experiences that uh, it's going to take a generation for many people to get those out of their memory. Um, whereas what we're seeing in Uzbekistan is they clearly are following the lessons of the, the more successful models. And what do you see when you talk to investors and they ask you, why the hell should I go to Uzbekistan? What does that have to offer for me? What do you see as the opportunities for Uzbekistan? Um, well, I mean, we've got a market which is actually a real market. We've got a population of uh, around 32 million people. Uh, 
Uh, it's uh, almost three times the size of Kazakhstan. It's a much more diversified economy than many of its neighbors. Belt Road Initiative is a strategic location, strategic spot. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of the, uh, uh, the historic complications and uh, some of its neighbors. And, uh, you know, I would say it's a, it's a culture that uh, has historically, for generations, it's been a trading culture. They're embracing the market institutions in a way that's much more intuitive, whereas in some of the other markets, I, I, I've been doing this like you a long time. I'm in my 29th year in this part of the world, and a lot of the cultural aspects of creating a market had to be learned in markets like Russia and Ukraine. Whereas I think in Uzbekistan, much of it is much more intuitive. Deputy Minister Kudrata, in listening tonight, what do you want to say to American investors about the investment environment in Uzbekistan? You worked here for a number of years, you know the American investment mentality, working there. What do they need to know that they might not know? Yes. Just to add to what uh, was mentioned, Uzbekistan is different now. It's, uh, uh, Uzbekistan is opening up for foreign businesses, for investors, and now it's the right time to invest in Uzbekistan, to utilize the opportunities and to grow with the, with the boosting economy of our country. Uh, to add what uh, JP Hutkin mentioned, uh, apart from the biggest market, Uzbekistan is also uh, politically and economically stable country. Uh, over the years of independence, they have never faced any issues or political unrest in our country. And uh, to add to the population, I also want to mention that Uzbekistan is the largest, has the largest workforce in the region, more than 15 million people. Uh, and the large uh, the workforce, which is very well educated and uh, uh, with the capacity to uh, be efficient in different sectors, different uh, areas of industries and services. Uh, another important area that uh, the government is committed to, to create the most attractive business climate in the region. We already have uh, reformed our tax system. The corporate tax in Uzbekistan is now the lowest in uh, CIS countries. We are working to uh, develop new mechanisms that will boost uh, uh, activities on foreign investors. Uh, one of the recent uh, steps was to develop and set up a direct investment fund with the assets of one billion US dollars. So this fund is aimed uh, to support new companies that are entering the market to share the risks. So basically this investment fund will co-invest up to 20 to 30 percent along the foreign investment to priority areas. We we'll also support foreign investors by uh, establishing the free economic zones, which Lab has mentioned yeah, with the other regulators, so the residents of those zones are exempted from all kinds of taxes, customs duties for up to 10 years, and the government provides activities, uh, investors can enjoy simplified visa uh, regime, uh, work, uh, work permits, and uh, other preferences. Great. What, uh, what can we, you've laid out a lot of what's been done already and the changes, you've heard a lot about it. What can we expect as the next stage in reform in Uzbekistan? What, next six months, year, what can foreign investors expect to see like the environment in the more track? More, more transparency, uh, less bureaucracy. Uh, this is the main uh, issue that the government is working on. Because uh, we have to admit that uh, the decisions that are made on the highest level sometimes are difficult to implement on the lower level and labor levels. So that is why we are working to make a more efficient government, more compact government, a uh, government which will work uh, on the e government principles to have less 
contact between the business and the government in taxation, in customs. So we would like to uh, eliminate, eliminate bureaucracy and make the life of businesses easier in Uzbekistan. I think every foreign investor likes to hear that message. Um, reduction of bureaucracy, making life easier. We have time for a couple of questions before we finish. Elena, did you have a question? I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please. Um, Sure. Thank you so much. Everyone knows you, but introduce yourself. Just for the of course. Um, my name is Sol, executive director of the American Space and Chamber of Commerce. And thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Mahabha, for the opportunity for our members of the guests to be here. As a host, I'd like to thank you. And of course, we're using the delegation in the second year of the Senate Support. Uh, my question is to Aziz, who is a great friend of the American Mexican Chamber of Commerce, and I know that you travel extensively uh, internationally. You know American business better than anybody else. You know our strengths, you know the advantages. What are our weaknesses? Because there is a very increasing competition from our neighbors in Asia as well as Europe. What do we need to do in order to be more competitive? What do we need as a group, for instance, to invest more so that we will be able to so that our members of the what does Uzbekistan need to do better? <laughs> well, what do we as a group? We, the the U.S. American Uzbekistan Asia. business community. Go ahead. Yes. So the AUCC is doing a great job during the United So thanks to the support of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, we we see more and more U.S. companies already in the Uzbek market. Today, the number of U.S. companies has exceeded 200 now. And the trade turnover is growing very fast. Last year, the, this five months of this year, the trade has increased 20%. So, in, in order to, to boost our trade and economic cooperation, uh, I believe that the Uzbek government should be, should be more active on promotion of the business opportunities here in the United States. Uh, work more with the AUCC and the US government to, to inform about the specific concrete projects, programs and opportunities in, in our country. Because uh, geographically the United States and Uzbekistan is uh, uh, far compared to other countries who are more active now in Uzbekistan. But I believe the US companies has a very unique advantage advantage by being the, one of the most innovative companies, companies with the best state of their technologies that are needed for Uzbekistan in order to have the competitive and sustainable economy. And that is in the interest of Uzbekistan and we are looking forward to a more uh, enhanced partnership with AUCC, the US government and other partners of France in Washington. Do we have a question over here? Yes, please. Frank Muradov uh, from uh, Alternative Investment Fund in New York City. Uh, Yelena's answer probably would be the number one problem Uzbekistan has is lack of human capital. That's, and we need probably thousands of people like Akarik Nazirov to go back to Uzbekistan. And that's the only solution we can see the ecosystem of investments, alternative investment space. Judicial, having laws is not enough. Printing laws is not enough. But we need, we need the human capital to be in place. We have 12 regions in Uzbekistan. Who are running those 12 regions? We need, we need people from US educated, US experience or Western experience who have a track record to execute the deals, to execute you know, uh, the projects, hands-on experience, and we can need to send them. And there are plenty of Uzbeks, Uzbek Americans, and Uzbekistanians who live in the U.S. And my solution would be to create a fund to attract them. And just a few people, not enough. So I would say that's the number one problem. And this is what we need to focus. Human capital will make a huge change. And this is what we're trying to solve. So if there wasn't a question at the end of that, I'll put one other. What do you think That's of that? a solution. That's the <laughs> proposition. Think, what do you think of that as a proposition? Both uh, Deputy Minister, Ujjadov, and JP. Absolutely. I fully agree with uh, 
the recommend and uh, the government is focused to bring the best to specs, uh, not only from the United States but from Europe, other parts of the world. So they have uh, uh, now the Uzbeks have returned to the government in almost all the ministries of the uh, government agencies, but of course that is not enough and we are inviting more and if there are Uzbeks who are willing to come back to the government, we are ready to provide uh, the necessary conditions to, to pay appropriate salary and you know, the, to, to, for them to, to be comfortable with the United States and work and contribute to the development of the yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, in, in the markets I've been involved in, it's the uh, return of human capital that's been an incredible catalyst. We've seen that over and over again in Russia, in Poland, in Ukraine, in Armenia, in Georgia. I mean, every, every one of the markets I've been involved in, that return of educated, experienced, expertise, and, and, and life experience, you can't put a price tag on it. And as I mentioned before, I mean, the fact that we have the uh, Capital Markets Development Agency being led by a former Goldman banker, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, the quality of the people that we deal with in Tashkent is, is fantastic. But it takes more than good ministers, deputy ministers, vice ministers, etc. And, uh, you know, the return of human capital is going to be a very important part of the process. Great. So the solution is we need more people like Hunter back in the zero. That's the conclusion that goes. Anyway, we have time for one more question before we wrap it up. Um, any more? I don't see seeing no hands. I think I'll turn it back to Ambassador Bahabov to um, wrap up the evening. I think we we're done with our second panel. Ambassador, you want to say any closing words and let people finish their desserts and uh, wrap up the evening? Thank you. Let's say an additional applaud to the Uzbek dessert. Let's applaud our great panelists. Thank you very much.